All right, so that's the chapter lecture. Now, the other thing is the hands-on projects, which is what most people want to, to do most, hands-on projects, where I actually do this stuff. So the projects are on my webpage down here. And so the way it works is you open one of these and it will be some instructions. So the first thing you have to do is make a machine to do your malware analysis in. Now, in fact, the malware we're using here is pretty harmless. So you could in fact run it on your laptop with Windows 10 or whatever you're using, but that's a poor practice and it might mess it up somewhat. So the right thing to do is have special virtual machines that you use just for malware analysis that are completely separate from the machine you use for other purposes. And you could use a local virtual machine in VirtualBox or VMware but what I highly recommend doing here is a Google Cloud machine. This is much better because many students cannot run local virtual machines on their hardware. They might have an iPad or a Chromebook or a Windows machine with high resolution. And just a lot of students cannot really run a local virtual machine. And local virtual machines are not that important, but cloud machines are very important. So if you have a credit card or a bank account, you can get free service from Google. They have to have the credit card, but they don't charge it. All you need is a Gmail account and you can use your City College Gmail account or you can make another one. And then you make cloud machines. So all you do is log into your Gmail and then you go to Google Cloud, cloud.google.com and you just click through a few steps and um, you can create virtual machines. So let me bring up mine, which I have here. All right, so here's my latest one. And by the way, they give you $300 of free service. And if you use it up, you just make another Gmail account and use the same credit card again and get another 300. I've done it about 25 times. Google doesn't care because Google is number three. Azure and Amazon are the number one and number two cloud platforms. And they're basically neck and neck fighting for number one. And Google is way behind them at like 5% of the market and they're trying to claw their way up to be one of the top two. And one of the ways they're doing it is by giving away a lot of free service to try to get business, which is great for us. So you can make free machines that you can make Linux machines and just open an SSH shell. But for this class, we're doing Windows machines. So you have to make a Windows machine. Now it's better to make your Windows machine more powerful than default because Windows is a real resource hog. So you'll you follow through the projects, you'll make it with two or four cores and uh, an SSD instead of memory. But when you're done, then you have a remote desktop protocol and you can click here and set your Windows password, which will set it to a long random password you can copy and save somewhere. And then you can download an RDP file so you control your machine with a remote desktop protocol. And if you haven't done it, this is something to get used to. Learning how to control cloud machines is really important. So you should be very, familiar with how to use Windows and Linux machines in the cloud with remote control tools. And if this is new to you, then you are definitely learning a valuable skill here. So you have an RDP file, then you need an RDP client. If you are running a Windows machine locally, it already has an RDP client built into it. And you can just double click this file and connect to a remote machine. If you're running a Mac, you have to download uh, a Microsoft code to do that which is uh, Microsoft Remote Desktop. So I've done that and I've connected to my Windows machine. So here uh, on my Mac, this is my Windows Desktop. You can recognize the start button and so on down here. So you can run code on your Windows machine. And let me just close some of these windows and show you what I've got here. Uh, I'll just open all these tools fresh. I was just working through the projects to make sure everything is updated before class. And uh, the first several projects are all ready to go. The rest are pretty good, but I might have a few things I wanna update with them as the semester goes by. So here's a bunch of windows I've left open. And there you see the Windows desktop. Um, so when you get a fresh Windows machine, there's a bunch of stuff you have to do, which I have here. Um, so you set up a Windows cloud machine, you set it up here, you choose, two cores might be enough, but when I wrote this, I made it four cores, which is fine. All it does is spend your fake money faster. And then here's really important, use Server 2016 with desktop experience. Microsoft now has this thing called Server Core, 
which gives you only a command line. So it's sort of like Linux. And that is not what we want. We want to be able to see the desktop and click on things. So make sure to get the desktop experience. And then uh, you create your machine and uh, then you can set your Windows password and um, get an RDP file, get an RDP client, which should be built into Windows, but if you have Linux or the Mac, you'll have to download a client, and then you connect to your machine. It'll ask you for a username and password. It will tell you to approve something about a certificate, and then you're in. So once you're on your machine, um, you want to block automatic updates. Uh, this is not strictly necessary, but it's, uh, it saves a lot of time. And so um, you can go here, open PowerShell, and run uh, sconfig to turn off the updates. Server config. Then you can turn off, this is really important, you won't be able to download anything or use the internet until you get rid of this IE enhanced security configuration. Server operating systems, which is what we're using, are not supposed to open browsers and go to the web. So by default, Microsoft doesn't allow that unless you turn this off in Server Manager. Then you can download files. So then, now we're gonna put malware on the machine. We're gonna put this whole folder of malware that came from the textbook, and it's not very nasty stuff, but it will trigger antivirus. And so Windows Defender will delete the malware and make our life miserable. So you have to adjust Windows Defender to not delete the malware. So you go into the Windows Defender settings and you exclude a folder. You make a folder on your desktop called malware and you tell Windows Defender not to look in that folder. Then you install Firefox because Internet Explorer is a drag. Firefox is a lot nicer. <coughs> and you install 7-Zip because the malware comes zipped. And now you can download this Practical Malware Analysis Labs.7z, which is a folder the compressed object that has all the malware we need to analyze in this class, except for a few labs where I have or some other third party things. You unzip this thing, it's got a password. This is typically what you do when you're doing malware for research. If you wanna put up a file and you don't want people accidentally running that file and then yelling at you and you end up being accused of having spread malware and broken the law and stuff, you put a password on it. And typically in the business, you use this password malware. So if you go to repositories where people have malicious samples for you to play with, well, which there's quite a few, they typically zip it with a password of malware. It's not like you really want to stop anybody from getting in. You just want to make sure nobody gets in by accident. So you unzip it with the password malware. It creates an executable that you run, which unzips it again and creates a folder full of files. And now in here, you find some malicious files to run. So this, when you get to a certain point in the project, you'll find a place where there is a flag. In this case, the flag is one of the file sizes, and there'll be a green box. So you find that number, and that's the flag. So you take a screenshot of your whole desktop, including the flag, and you make a note of this, and then you go in Canvas, there'll be a project, and you can upload that screenshot and the value here to get your points. That's how you turn in your homework inside Canvas. So by the way, when you're done using your Windows machine, turn it off. You can turn it off from the Google Cloud Control Panel, which is here, the Google Cloud Console. You can turn it off here, stop. You can also go into the machine and use your start button. If you don't stop it, it will burn up like five or $10 of your fake money per day. So you only have $300 and it'll use it all up and then you'll have to make a new account. If you turn it off when you're not using it, then your $300 will last a lot longer. Anyway. Um, all right, so that's the first project, and you should all start doing that. And I think um, I'm just gonna demonstrate the next couple of projects because that's where, you, this is all just getting your machine ready. Once you've got your machine ready, this goes through the techniques we talked about in lecture. So you, first you find some malware. Let me bring up my machine here. So here's my Windows machine, and here's my malware. So I go in here, and there's a folder called Practical Malware Analysis Labs binary chapter one, and here's some files. Um, uh, Lab01, DIL, and EXE. And so I could analyze these by dragging them and sending them up to VirusTotal. And then you'll see that a bunch of engines do detect it, which is kind of silly because it's a fake virus. But anyway, um, you can just drag files up and upload them to VirusTotal and see what various antivirus engines say, them or say about them. We're not going to use that further right now. We're going to use other techniques, the kind of techniques you'd use 
if you didn't find it in virus total, because that's what we're here to learn how to analyze new unknown malware. So the first tool we're going to use is PE view. And all you have to do is download it and unzip it. All these tools are free downloads. So once you've got PE view, I just put them all in my downloads folder. So I downloaded PE view and unzipped it. So it's here. So when I run it, it's going to complain that this came from some unknown publisher. I'll just run it anyway. This, by the way, is another reason why you want to use a throwaway machine because most of these analysis tools are not signed and not really trustworthy. So, uh, and so if I analyze one of these malware samples, this PE view is showing me what's inside there. And so here I have the raw binary dump of the file, starting with the MZ and having this program cannot be run in DOS mode. And I could just examine it this way and you'll see some junk and down here, you'll see some readable text, close handle, unmap view of file. These are windows function calls and so on. And then at the end, you got some more uh, library names and warning, this will destroy your machine messages and such. So that's one way to examine a file, but you can do better because this is a PE file. It has a certain structure. And so you can see things here like the NT headers. Here's the signature. Here's um, the time date stamp showing you when it was compiled, what time of day, and the first, um, and here's the date stamp in binary. Here you've got the text section, the summary of how big it is, and the R data and R data. Here's what the text section looks like. This is assembly code. You can't hardly read assembly code in this raw hex form. We're going to use disassemblers and debuggers to read that stuff later. This is what it looks like when it's raw. Here's the R data section. This is often readable. Close handle, unmap view of file, and here's the other data section. So that's a layout of this thing. And so you can open a file and find a flag, just the date stamp of one of these files to show that you got that working. So that's PE view that just lets you view the header and get some general information about your file. PEID also gives you information about the file. And in particular, it tells you what language it was written in and whether it's packed. So let's uh, go to PEID, which is just another download. PEID, PEID. Run that. And now this three dot thing lets me open a file. So if I open lab01.dil, it will tell me here that it was written in Visual C++ 6. It was normally compiled with a normal compiler, and normal compilers put labels in the header of the file that it can find, and it'll tell me more like what the sections are and such. But here, the only thing I really care about is to find the name of the language it was written in, because we're going to use that for packers. And here's my favorite, the one I mentioned, bin text. If you don't know anything about a file, this is a way to learn a lot about it very easily. You download and run this bin text program from McAfee, and this just looks for readable text in a file. So you browse to your file, and you open something like labo101.dil and go, and it just shows you all the readable strings in the file. Here's the thing that says this program cannot be run in DOS mode, and here it has close handle and create process, kernel 32, Here's something that looks like an IP address. It's just got a lot of things that you can read here so you can get a clue what it does. This thing creates a process. It creates a mutex, which is a mark in the memory that we're going to talk more about later. It calls the kernel 32 library and the WS2 library, which implies that it does some networking, I think, WS2. It does a string comparison, string n compare. And so it's you can get these strings give you a clue about what the base functionality of the file is. So there's a few things to analyze here and a flag to find. And then there's dependency walker. I don't think I'll bother demonstrating it live, but dependency walker shows you all the libraries that are called, all the functions that are called. And again, you can sort of guess, like here's this one, Labo 101. I think this is the EXE. It's cutting through the file system. Find first file, find next file, create file mapping. It's hunting through the file system to find something. So that gives you some clue about what it's doing. It's apparently creating some file. And before it does that, it wants to search and make sure it doesn't create the file twice. 
So that is a clue that there's probably an indicator of compromise here, which would be the file it creates. And if you look at the strings, you can find the full path to the file it creates and find the indicator of compromise in there. So uh, there's these step-by-step -step instructions that guide you right to the flags. And then there are some challenges for extra credit without instructions, where you have to practice using these tools on a different file and figure out which tool will find this one downloads a file, so you have to figure out which tool will find the name of the file that gets downloaded. And here you find the function that's imported, and here you find the date stamp. So that's the process. You'll find a series of flags, and you submit them in the, um, in the project in Canvas. And I think that's probably enough for today. That There's unpacking. Uh, so you should be reading the book. There's quizzes to take and there's projects to do, and you should put, uh, introduce yourself on the discussion board. So that hopefully is enough to get you started. I'm gonna stop this video, but I will leave the Zoom session go.